Hi, everybody. What's going on? Welcome to Sit Down. I'm DJ Sixman, hanging out with Brian Raftery. Brian, congrats on the new book. Thank you so much. It's great to have you here. Great. Thanks so much. Great to be here, DJ. You got it. So why don't you wind me back a little bit? You were a New York guy. You've been writing in the entertainment space for a long time. So how did you get involved in this whole crazy business? And who were some writers <laughs> growing up that you like to read? Oh wow! Well, I grew up. I mean, my I, I grew up in the a long time ago when there were newspapers. <laughs> um, my parents actually worked in newspapers. Oh, they cool. both worked at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Nice. So um, I did not ever set out to become a journalist, but it was one of those things where by the time I was ten or eleven, you know, you're doing your own family news <laughs> newspaper yeah, and making yeah. up fake newspapers. So I really grew up reading uh, a lot of newspaper writers, and I grew up weirdly reading a lot of film critics. I definitely. I loved reading Roger Ebert's mm. capsule reviews. Or I would get the big books, and my brother and I were would go through these big movie guides that were of all these R-rated movies we weren't allowed to see. <laughs> and so we would read them and like try to guess. It was like this one's R-rated for adult situations. What are adult situations? <laughs> um, so I read a lot of that. I read a lot of the Philadelphia Inquirer and New York Times film critics like Carrie Rickey and Desmond Ryan. Um, I love. I mean, I cut out movie reviews. I would. I would save all the movie reviews from a new movie, and then when I go see it on Friday or Saturday night, I'd come back home and I'd pick up all the reviews from that week and read all the reviews as soon as I saw the movie. That's cool. Um, so I always loved this, and I loved writing about culture. Um, I always loved, sort of, I, I, my mom was a features reporter, so I sometimes would read her work, and I sort of understood how you interview people and how to take a story and make it you know, accessible for a newspaper audience, and, and my dad was a newspaper editor, so he loved history, and so we would read a lot of history books and talk about journalism and talk about stories. It was like a family where you would send each other stories and go, oh, I think mm. you like this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was a very much like, I just grew up around media, and my mom was also, and remains to this day, a huge movie fan, so I watched lots of movies <laughs> as a kid I should not have watched. Like, I watched like, the birds when I was 10, and wow. I'm like, this is not a good, this is a good <laughs> Like, I saw Psycho when I was like 11 or 12, oh and I'm my like, gosh. what are you doing to me? <laughs> but my mom would watch old movies, and she always had a spot on the couch for me to sit there, and I didn't always understand what they were, <laughs> didn't understand these movies when I was a kid, but I really loved film, and loved talking about it and thinking about it. So it was just, it was in the bloodlines, it, it was, was in your the life from very yeah. long. I think I tried to deny it for a while, but then I was like, Everyone thinks I'm just going to fall in their footsteps. I might as well embrace I, it. Yeah, why not? It's a good, you know, it's a good path, you know. So yeah. let's talk about '99 sure. because obviously you're reporting on it, you're yeah. living through it. At the time, what do you remember about the big movies that came out that year? Did you realize it was going to be a huge year, or now as you reflect, you can realize, wow, this was really a major year? I think we knew a little bit. I mean, I was in a weird place. I graduated from college. I was at Penn State, and so and Penn State back in the late '90s was not a big movie town. There mm -hmm. were only a couple of rural theaters, so it's weird. 1999 has all these films like. The Matrix and being John Malkovich and Election and Phantom Menace and Fight Club. Um, and the some of them came out when I was in my last year in school. Like, I barely even got to see Election in the theater. Mm. Um, a movie like The Matrix, I had to wait because I had finals or something. I couldn't <laughs> see. I had a midterm or something. Right. So the first half of the year, I was like, oh, this is just a regular kind of bunch of movies. And then I moved to New York City in the summer of 1999. I got my first job, which was an internship at Entertainment Weekly. And I was suddenly surrounded by, I was like, these are my people. It's like all they want to <laughs> do is talk about, yeah, it's like, we're just going to talk about movies and music and TV shows <laughs> all day. And then also we can go see movies for free in these things called screening rooms. Um, so I think at that point, I was surrounded by a lot of really smart people. Um, including uh, you know, Mark Harris, who's a really big film historian, and Lisa Schwarzbaum, Owen Gleiberman, who were the film critics at EW. And I was just a tiny little <laughs> newt in the, but I would, you could listen into their conversations. And I think at, the, at a point late in that year, the narrative was starting to become clear that, wait a minute, mm. this is a ridiculously good year for film. And especially by the end when you did have Three Kings and being John Malkovich and Boys Don't Cry and Magnolia sort of showing up. Yeah and Fight Club, and these are movies that even if you didn't like them, you absolutely had to see them because they were a huge talking point. And there was a lot of excitement for films, and it wasn't just sort of these really smart kind of art house blockbusters. I mean, you also had Notting Hill that year, which was a huge movie. You had American Pie, which was a huge movie. You had all these original uh, stories from like a lot of first-time filmmakers mm that were making more than $100 million and were absolutely dominating the culture that year. So it felt at the time pretty exciting. In the last 10 years, it's become clear just how important that mm. year was because now that year feels a little more far away. Right. And I, think, I think people thought this is the one movies are gonna be like for the rest of our lives. And what happened was TV kind of came along. Mm. 99 was The Sopranos and The West Wing. Right. And John Stewart took his first shot at The Daily Show that year. So TV was already slowly, you could see the seeds of what was gonna happen with the change of what we talk about when we talk about movies and TV all day, which, which I still do, yeah. but it's very, yeah, it's very different now. But especially now with so much crossover with yeah. people who had done movies for so long coming to TV yeah. because they're interested in the scripts and the new platforms and yep. the projects. Like 99 is people are just going to the movie theaters and these are big budget projects yeah. and they're 
bringing in millions and millions of dollars, not the same thing today. No, and it, I mean, I interviewed more than about 130 sort of actors and filmmakers for the book. I mean, like people like Reese Witherspoon and Edward Norton. And what was really interesting is a lot of the filmmakers, especially that I was trying to get, I had to juggle their TV schedule yeah. because they're working. You know, David Fincher is doing this huge Netflix TV show. Mm -hmm. You know, Steven Soderbergh does a lot of TV. Uh, Kimberly Pierce, who co-wrote and co-directed or co sorry, co-wrote and directed Boys Don't Cry, she's doing TV. So a lot of these huge directors who broke through that year um, are working in different spaces now. I mean, Spike Jones hasn't made a movie in a couple of years. He did like a really cool TV mm -hmm. ad last year, which was sort <laughs> of his big deal. Yeah. So they're all moving, they're, they're still involved in movies, but it's their TV and the sort of the sort of idea of the screen in your pocket is kind of becoming the medium now. It's a game everyone. changer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So this book obviously took several years to make and several hundreds and thousands of emails right, in order to yeah, get yeah. these people. Right. So when does the idea first come about and how difficult was this whole thing? Like, What were the biggest challenges you faced mm. along the way? Um, well, it came about because in 2016, I was really thinking about Y2K a lot. Mm. I think uh, 2016 was kind of a weirdly apocalyptic year. What happened in 2016? Uh, yeah, yeah, a little election, election went something? on, yeah. It was a very unstable time yeah. and it made me think about 99. Mm -hmm. And so I originally just started I just started working on a book proposal about that year because that year is really interesting. I mean, you're a sports fan. That was the women's soccer team winning that yeah. year, which was a huge, huge. event. Yeah. yeah, you had um, you had Y2K fears. You had Columbine, Columbine which is I national. About that. Yeah, yeah, Columbine national tragedy. You had the riots in Seattle at the mm -hmm. end of the year, the World Trade Organization. Um, and so there was a lot of, and Donald Trump announced his first presidential run in 2009, oh, which a lot right, of people right. don't remember yeah. his very brief first <laughs> attempt to run for president, which got huge news. And he was mm -hmm. like mentioned on the cover of Newsweek. So I was like, oh, what if we took at all these events? And then halfway through when I was sort of working on that, um, an editor at Simon & Schuster just emailed me out of the blue and said, have you ever thought about writing about just the movies of that year? And we talked about it, and I realized more and more that you could touch on the importance of Columbine. You could touch on the sort of what's going on with Y2K through the movies of that year, because a lot of those, these films felt like they were they were accidentally kind of telling us what the future was going to be. Yeah, totally. um, and so from there, it was just two years of we had a very tight deadline because it had to come out. We wanted to come out with the 20th anniversary mm -hmm. of these films. So, you know, in 20, I did the first interview I think in January 2017, wow. and that was two and a half years ago, and it was kind of nonstop. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of trying to get these people to talk who were great, and I got more people than I thought I would get. Um, a lot of big names. It just you're jumping, you're working with their schedules, and they have layers of publicists and agents yep. who were all very helpful, but there was there was one filmmaker where I looked back and I was like, I think it was 164 emails oh gosh. just on my <laughs> end. Like, I don't even know how many replies just to get like an hour with him. Um, but they were all game for it. I mean, these people, I think these filmmakers and these actors realize that A, these are very important movies and they want to be part of telling the story because actors and filmmakers do have egos about these things. Absolutely, you know, they like to talk mean, about themselves. I don't yeah. mean to knock them, but you know, no. they want to make sure they're part of it. But I also think they do realize that it was kind of a special year. And I think for some Definitely. of the younger actors, we're talking to, you know, there were so many teen and youth aimed movies that year. So, you know, I talked to Reese Witherspoon and Ryan Felipe and Sarah Michelle Geller and Selma Blair about, you know, movies like Cruel Intentions and, and Election. And for them, they're very young, you know, they were very young at this time. This was a, pr they were in their 20s and this was a very important time in their lives and their careers. And I think they have, and I'm about the same age as them, and I think mm -hmm. they have this nostalgia for, their 20s, and I think there's also a lot of nostalgia for, frankly, you know, pre-9-11 life. I mean, the totally. 90s were a very troubled decade, which we're kind of rewriting to be like, wasn't it great? And it's like, there were a lot of bad things <laughs> in the 90s. I loved it, I had a good time, but yeah. you know. But I do think there is this nostalgia, there's this warmth for it now, because it's like, you could, back then, you could afford to just like walk around the block and navel gaze, and you get all these really interesting navel gazing <laughs> movies, like Fight Club yeah. or, or, or Office Space, which is very much a movie about, a, you know, this guy's only problems in life is that he doesn't like working. Right. And he kind of frees himself of it. So it feels like they're sl slightly from a different era where you can kind of afford to just kind of let your brain sort of ruminate on, not on world crises, but on immediate right in front of you kind of existential problems. No doubt. And even yeah. with Blair Witch Project, going to the theater yeah. and not knowing if that is real or not. Yeah. Like, now, did that's you know it was real when you saw, did you see it in the theater or on video? Or no, no, it? I have, had, did not see it in theater. Oh, okay. So yeah, I saw it much later. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. again, didn't, it wasn't the same experience as it was in 99 where people were like, wait a minute, yeah. what's going on? Like the only thing I can kind of think of was like when Cloverfield first yes, came out. that's the only, yeah. Kind of similar, right? And I think even that now would be, I mean, that was only what, 10, 12 years ago? Or something yeah, like something that. like that. But people be tweeting about yes. it. You, people yeah. be talking about it. Like people were actually going to the theater, not yeah. knowing if this was legit. So like, for that to be one of the first movies you write about, like that's just a fascinating case study in how we've evolved as a movie-going society, mm -hmm. but also just as a society in general. So, oh yeah, what was most fascinating to you about that movie and that whole experience? I mean, that the movie itself, the production of that film, where they basically took these three actors and put them in the woods for you know more than a week 
and didn't officially torture them, yep. but put them through a very kinda rigorous sorta, yeah. kind of sort of improv exercise where, you know, they these actors sort of kind of knew where they were going day to day, but they were getting, I mean, they were using GPS to kind of guide them through right. the woods. The filmmakers were hidden. They had camouflage on, so and they were using different formats of cameras, and the actors themselves were shooting everything and mm. recording everything. Um, so it was a very disorienting experience, and I think by the end, those actors were very happy to get out, to get <laughs> out of the sure woods. They were. But you know, the, the, the interesting thing about the Blair Witch also is the phenomenon that you mentioned is that the internet's kind of a supporting character in this book. I mean, the internet totally. in 1999 is, you know, I went online in 94, and I was on AOL, and all, you know, the, that era where it was something you, you checked in the morning and at night, it right. wasn't 24 hours. So it kind of felt like this distant, unknowable thing, but you know, th on the internet, the Blair Witch became a phenomenon before the first trailer was even out. People just sort of, they put up this website very early, and they never really said whether it was real or not, and so people just started following these clues, and these message boards started popping up. As you said, in a way now, I think on Twitter, within a day, people would be like, fake, right. right, next thing. But it, w it really helped spur the phenomenon, and a lot of these movies are sort of about, you can look at them as being about internet culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly The Matrix is about Di you know, using this virtual world and diving into it. I totally. think Office Space, that scene that we all know where they break, they bash they the yeah, fax the machine yeah, yeah. with the f baseball bats. I mean, uh, who does not feel that about their phone sometimes? Mm -hmm. They're like, I just want to be off the grid. Totally. Um, and even being John Malkovich, to me, that feels like a movie that's about, I mean, it's a movie where people discover a portal into John Malkovich's brain mm -hmm. and kind of hijack him for 15 minutes at a time. And to me, it feels like that's kind of what the internet is now. It's like yeah. people just come in, they can steal your identity. There's identity totally. theft. That's what it is. And it's also... Being John Malkovich is also sort of about our relationship with celebrities online now, where we sort of mm. feel like we know them and we kind of are trying to dictate their lives by tweeting at them, and it's very strange. I mean, the, the internet's certainly in the back is the background noise of a lot of these films. No doubt. Let's talk about the Matrix because yeah. I love the reporting you did in there. They're in Australia. There's yeah. a bunch of what ifs about people being yeah. in this film. Are there a couple actors you wonder, like, man, if if uh, if Leo had been in this, <laughs> or Pitt, are there a couple guys that you could think of? With that? Well, even even like. Um, uh, Sandra Bullock. Yeah, yeah, yeah that I mean, was they, a really interesting what if. I mean, the, the Matrix now, we all look back at it and go, yeah, The Matrix, huge movie. Right. It's like, like who, no. who would second guess that? <laughs> but the Wachowskis were largely, I mean, they were, they'd made a movie. They weren't unproven filmmakers, but they had not made anything like this. They'd written the script years before. It had gone through all these executives who didn't fully understand it. And when you read the script, it's kind of like, what? Like, <laughs> yeah. if you try to read it now and you just pretend the movie never was made, you'd be like, I don't understand what this is. Totally. Like it's, yeah. it's very compelling, but you're like, it's very strange imagery. You're going into a computer world. Um, so Warner Brothers had a hard time finding actors, and so they went through, as you mentioned, I mean, I think they talked to Leonardo DiCaprio mm -hmm. at one point because he was, you know, mid or post Titanic. Right. You know, I think, um, you know, Will Smith, I they, they think they wanted at one point Michael Douglas or Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah, 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 Morpheus. Right. But yeah, at one point, they got so frustrated without being able to find a lead to play Neo, who's the young you know, hacker who gets plunged into the Matrix, that they even thought about just rewriting that character as a female and, and offering it to Sandra Bullock. I know, crazy um, what if there. It is a crazy what if, and I think, you know, but I think they really liked that. They got Lawrence Fishburne as, as Morpheus, who's fantastic. Absolutely. I mean, no one else could play that. No. He's got such gravitas. He's having so much fun with that movie. Mm -hmm. But I also think Keanu Reeves, who was in a weird place career-wise, he yeah. he's perfect. Totally. He's, he's to play that kind of blank slate. I don't mean as an insult, like he has that kind of idea that uh, kind of presence where it's kind of like what's going on with this guy you don't really know and for Neo who has no idea what he's doing for half the movie and is kind of being thrown into this world of bullet time bending backwards mm -hmm. and it's a, it's pretty perfect casting, um, and I think it, that helped the movie a lot. It was funny. I was on Twitter this morning, and there was a baseball pitcher who ducked out of the way of a line drive coming right back to him, mm -hmm. and the tweet was just Matrix 1999. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing about it. I mean, the Matrix of all these movies, I think that movie has is probably the biggest in the culture, and I think the internet. I mean, like, I, I, it's funny. I was just thinking of the day, like, I don't think there's been a day in the last 20 years where there's not been a Morpheus gift somewhere or a uh, Neo gift. It's yeah. a, I mean, the Matrix is like the meme tricks. It's just basically yeah. like it's this un, it's this completely unstoppable, you know, resource of allegories and in jokes and visuals. You can because people watch that movie. I don't think there's anyone in the Matrix who's seen the Matrix who has the exact same thoughts as someone else. Like, well, I remember walking out of it and being like, well, that's an anti. That's an anti-technology movie. Mm. My friend was like, are you kidding? It's the best <laughs> movie about computers and what they can do. And I was like, really? That like, movie wait, scared me. Um, <laughs> but you know, people see it as an allegory for everything for everything now. And then there's huge philosophical and religious readings of The Matrix. Um, so it's kind of remarkable how it's lasted in the culture. And I don't think there's anyone, if you showed a split second of The Matrix mm -hmm. to anyone walking around Times Square, they'd be like, it's The Matrix. Yeah. Everyone knows iconic. the visual. It's, it's super iconic. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about Office Space. Sure. So you wrote about it. My buddy Jake Kring yeah, yeah, wrote it was a great about piece. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's so many different fascinating parts to this. Even Jennifer Aniston getting in there, how yeah. important that was. 
even just the poster itself, how it didn't sell the movie the right yeah. way. What interests <laughs> you most so about that whole process in the movie? I think what's interesting to me about Office Space is like it was, you know, Mike Judge at that time, no one, you know, now he runs Silicon Valley. Right. He's had these huge, huge hit shows. And back then he was the Beavis and Butthead guy. Right. And I've talked to him, I've interviewed him a couple times over the years, and he really, people forget that in the 90s, he was in Butthead was really looked down upon by mm -hmm. the industry. Like it made a lot of money, but he always he was an outsider. He never felt like he quite fit in with Hollywood. And so now he's getting to make his first big sort of studio live action film. And it was really hard for him. And I think the studio had trouble trusting him because they're like, wait a minute. This guy does Beavis and Butthead, and he's making this movie about working in an office, and half the scenes are kind of depressing. There's no, you know, because if you watch Office Space, you watch the trailer, it's like, what joke? We all know the jokes from Office Space sure. now because we quote them on every Monday, yeah. in this case, the Mondays, but those are hard movies to, like, those are hard jokes to squeeze into a trailer and to squeeze it's into, It's a like, really tough sell. It's a tough sell, yeah. and it, the movie did not do well, and you know, the studio really pinned it on the fact that Jennifer Aniston, who was on Friends at the time, was in it, but even that couldn't sell it. And I think, you know, I talked to some of the actors who were in that movie, and they went to see an opening weekend, they're like, we're basically in an empty theater. <laughs> um, but I think if you were to ask someone who was really young, who wasn't alive in 1999, they would be shocked to find out that Office Space wasn't a huge hit, because mm -hmm. kind of like The Matrix, I mean, that is also a movie where, you know, every day, when I interview Gary Cole, he's like, who played Lumberg? He's mm -hmm. like every day someone sends me a bunch of Lumberg memes. Totally. It's like it's like Facebook. Certain sectors of Facebook are just <laughs> Lumberg accepting <laughs> coffee memes and, and jokes. And I think that movie is, you know, it's stayed. It's kind of it's lasted this long because I think aside from being really funny, it is a very funny. It's exactly my kind of comedy, mm -hmm. which is very funny, but also is acknowledging how dark human yeah. enemy, humanity is. But that movie also, you put the Matrix, you put Office Space, you put a, you put Fight Club together. They're kind of, they're not the same movie, but mm -hmm. they're three movies about these young guys, mostly guys in these movies, um, who are trying to escape their lives and kind of need this very radical liberation. I mean, Neo has to plunge into the Matrix. He has to basically, you know, he has to take the right pill to find out what's going on. Um, in Office Space, Ron Livingston just says, I'm not working anymore. <laughs> right. And it's like, he, he, because of this trance. And in Fight Club, you have Edward Norton basically sliding, becoming uh, a maniac, a crazy person, and, you know, becoming Tyler Durden unknowingly and making this whole, or building this whole army while he mm. sleeps. And I think all those movies kind of speak to this idea of, like, I need to get out from who I am, like, who am I, and how can I change that? And I think that's why they kind of resonate, aside from just being, you know, in Office Space's case, really, really mm. funny. I remember when I watched Fight Club for the first time, and my mind was just completely blown. Yeah, yeah. So when you were talking with Ed Norton, I mean, you had to be on your game, obviously, for that interview. What was most fascinating about that conversation with him? I think what's really interesting is he's, he, you know, Edward Norton was, at that point, he could have done any movie he wanted to. He was coming off, I mean, he was the golden boy of the late 90s. Yeah. I think it really was, Leo was the box office golden mm -hmm. boy, and also super talented, and Edward Norton was suddenly like, who is this guy? And there was Damon and Affleck, but I think, at that point in the late 90s, Edward Norton, you look at Primal Fear, People vs. Larry Flint, he did this Woody Allen musical, he was making really interesting choices, and this was like a very dangerous movie. Mm. This was a movie that I think um, an actor who was more uh, worried about how he'd be perceived by the public would be like, this is a little too scary for me, I don't want to do this, and he dove right in. And what's interesting is you have Brad Pitt, who's the biggest, you know, just the, Big the biggest, biggest megastar, yeah. of the, one of the biggest megastars of that decade, and you have Edward Norton playing these two very different, it's like the ultimate alpha male, and then Edward Norton playing this kind of like schlubby, kind of, not schlubby, but just kind of like pasty face, mm -hmm. kind of losery guy. Yeah. Um, and what's really interesting about Fight Club is that how much of the back and forth between Edward Norton and the director David Fincher was, how funny is this? Is this a comedy? Is this a nihilistic uh, action movie is this a f is this a social satire and they were thinking of the graduate that was the movie they kept mm. talking about which is you can read that as a starkly funny movie sure. you can also look at that as like a very downbeat look at modern life and so the two of them trying to debate what this movie is and trying to figure out just how funny they can be is really interesting to me because I saw that movie on opening on Friday night uh, like at 68th Street and I remember standing up and just being pummeled by it and yeah. seeing my friend being like that was too much. I really liked it. Yeah. But it was it was only a few months after Columbine. And it was Columbine a lot. delayed the movie. Yeah. And, you know, they 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 moved the, right. the movie a few months because of Columbine. It was a really that movie was reacted to so strongly. Um, and I had friends who I uh, to this day I still love and respect who absolutely hated it and really, really? thought it was irresponsible. Hmm. I think they've changed a little bit, but you have to view that movie what it was like at this time when we just had this massive violent incident and we were going toward Y2K and there were weird you know, bomb threats mm -hmm. and stuff about Y2K so it was scary to watch this movie and be like, is this funny? Is this advocating mm -hmm. for violence? I always thought it was a, a, a very 
I always thought it was kind of funny. I, mean, I have a very dark sense of humor, but I also remember just being like, you know, the end of that movie with the, the skyscrapers, the credit card companies are mm. blown up, and yeah. the Pixie song is playing, and you're like, this is the end? <laughs> this is terrifying. <laughs> now it's it like, makes sense based yeah. on the context of the year. Yeah, I mean, I mean when you watch it later, it's a little different. Yeah, you know? I mean, I think people who, you know, I think people who have revisited it in the years afterward are a lot more forgiving of it. I do think it was a shock at that time, and I think yeah. it was it was asking a lot of questions and picking a lot of scabs that we were just kind of like, no, don't want to deal with this right now. Things are kind of mm. getting a little too scary. Yeah. Well, you mentioned picking scabs. How about election in terms of a, a teacher-student relationship? You know that that's not something that's very easy to talk about, let alone no. for the movie. So. No, I mean that's and that's it's my favorite movie of that yeah, year. I know you've said that. Yeah. Why is that? I think it's I I hate to say because it it's so hyperbolic, but like I think that movie's perfect. I mm. don't know. I've watched I watched all these movies at least four or five times right. each. I mean I watched them as movies. I watched the commentary tracks, which I recommend are great. You can find these DVDs for a dollar online, that's and cool. the commentary tracks are if you don't, can't afford film school, like just that is your film are, school. Yeah. yeah, the Alexander Payne commentary track on Election is super insightful um, but I think that movie which is about you know Reese Witherspoon plays this very ambitious very smart um, young woman who wants to get win this school election and Matthew Broderick plays this middle-aged guy who is just just kind of wants to thwart her and is kind of frustrated with his own life it's got a rough marriage going he's on. he's got a rough yeah. marriage going on he's not super happy I mean he's he's kind of stuck like a lot of these movies are about middle-aged guys yep. who are stuck yeah. and so he kind of tries to rig the election and she take some of, her, some of her own sort of moral, morally dubious decisions, and they kind of clash, and I think it's a really, first of all, it's a really funny movie. It's very empathetic to all the characters. I think when it came out, people were like, this is about a really terrible young woman who just wants anything, and I think now you look at that movie, you're like, this is a young woman who's being treated terribly by all these men in her mm. life. Like, she's she's absolutely deserves to be angry, and she absolutely, her a lot of her behavior is justified. Um, but Reese Witherspoon is so good, and you know, she, she spent a couple of days kind of in this high school in Nebraska, oh, kind really? of sneaking in as a student okay. to sort of blend in. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she was a pretty big star at that point when she filmed it, when they filmed it, but she was not Reese Witherspoon yet. Um, and she's really good at it. It's like you can see so much of the timing that she has in movies like Legally Blonde st starting an election. Uh, and I just think it's it's it feels very relevant. All the things they're talking about in that movie, which is the way political campaigns mm -hmm. are run, the way men and women are treated in, in, in the workplace or wherever they are, a lot of those things resonate, I think, very strongly. And I also just think it's super funny. It's just, there's, there's scenes in that movie where I just, like, this is an insanely dark, R-rated, high school set Midwest comedy that could not be more delightful or kind of insightful. Yeah, yeah. I love it, I love it, yeah. No doubt. So yeah. when people pick up the book, there's obviously a ton packed in there, but what are a couple big tentpole thoughts you want them to walk away thinking about 99? I'd love for people to re-watch re some of these movies, but I certainly think, you know, I think if you can look at these movies in the context of the time and sort of think about, I mean, not to be too lofty, but like <laughs> the way, you know, sometimes we, uh, nowadays, the culture is so fractured and, you know, maybe you're watching Russian Doll and mm -hmm. I'm catching up on Succession or someone's watching, you know, the Beyonce Netflix special right. and someone else is talking about, you know, whatever book they just mm -hmm. read, the Logic novel <laughs> or something, you know, it's like, so, but back then, these movies really were kind of essential. You had to watch them, and if you look at them, again, not to be pretentious, but like this was really kind of all these really interesting, smart artists being given tons of money in some yeah, cases. Yeah, huge so, runways. Tons of, yeah, yeah big runways, exactly. And it, people were like, okay, here's $50 million. What is your big idea? Mm -hmm. And then you, and these ideas were often really deep in ways we didn't realize right. at the time. Like really kind of trying to deal with where is the world going? Who are we? And I think the fact that we all had to stop for a little while and go, you know, even if Fight Club pummeled you, you didn't walk, you walked away being like, huh, maybe I, maybe I am too much caught up in what's my wallet dictating but my I life. But I need to you talk know? about yeah, this. Yeah, you need to talk yeah. about it. You need to talk about Fight Club, yeah. yeah. And I think that's one thing to really realize that there was this period where the culture was kind of a mass culture and everything that's happened in the last 20 years with fewer gatekeepers and more voices is great. I think what was interesting about these, these movies, though, is this idea that everyone really was talking about the same thing um, and really trying to hash these things out instead of just going from this week's episode of Game of Thrones right. to next week's episode right. of, of, you know, of, of, of Shrill or whatever mm -hmm. show you're watching. Um, so I think it was kind of a fun moment to be in the culture. I don't think it's necessarily better than what's happening now. I'm, I'm not a throwback nostalgist. Right. Like, but it, it was just kind of, yeah. yeah, it was just a, a different interesting times. So people especially who are younger uh, like to sort of look at it and be like, oh, this is a time where you had to go to the movies on Friday yeah. because on Monday, you had you were going to be called on, like you were going to be like, what did you think? Uh, what did you think of Notting Hill? What did you think of Blair Witch Project? What did you think of you know any of those movies? And you couldn't year? wait for it to come out on Netflix or Amazon. Yeah, or no, you had to wait for DVD, yeah. which sometimes to took six to nine months. <laughs> yeah, six to six to eight months to see a movie. You didn't see it; it was gone. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. really fascinating. Well, it's a great book. Oh, thanks, DJ. Best Appreciate movie it. year ever, Brian. It's been an absolute Thanks, pleasure. so much fun. Yeah, this is great. Hi, right, everybody. See you next time here on the Sit Down.